So we've come to chapter 10. Um, I've titled this Great Gifting, Poor Character. We're particularly looking at the character of Solomon. Obviously, he's been the prominent figure in the book so far. But just a bit of a recap um, for those who, who may have been present for part or missed certain elements of, of what we've been looking at. We're really, we're really believing that, that by going through the Book of Kings at this time, this is, even though this is a word that was, is, is centuries old, um, and in a, in a context and in a society that's so different from what we're living in today, actually, we're really believing that God has things that he wants to say to us and wants to communicate to us. And uh, I think that will come out as we go through. So at the beginning of the chapter, or the beginning of the book, we can see death of David, and Solomon is anointed as king. We then see that Solomon, in chapter 3, asks for wisdom, which is a very important part of the, of the book, um, and a good thing that he asked God to do in him. We then see that in chapter 4, we have this interesting episode where he basically assassinates all the, the other people who were looking to take the king position. And then throughout the course of the next chapters, it's about building the temple, the palace. And then in the final chapter, which I think um, Fatima talked about last week, it was about God appearing to Solomon again and issuing him some quite stark warnings. So in terms of where we are now in chapter 10, this is really Solomon at his peak of fame and glory. Um, on the surface, everything looks quite rosy. Everything looks quite good. But I think as we'll see as we go through, things are not quite as they should be beneath the surface. So just giving a bit of an overview of the chapter as a whole. Um, so really, in terms of chapter 10, again, as we'll go through it shortly, we see that on the surface, things look OK. Um, the narrator or the writer of the book isn't explicitly condemning, necessarily, the things that Solomon's doing. And actually, some of the things are good. But we see, if we look beneath the surface, there are some issues. And really, the, the book is sort of split into two halves. We've got the first half, um, verses 1 through 13, which we'll hear through shortly. And it's really profiling Solomon's wisdom, which is the thing that he asked for, and also the fame and the fortune. And then the second half of, of the chapter, it's revealing how really Solomon had fallen. Um, and, and that doesn't, isn't so obvious when you read it, but if we look at the broader context of the book, that comes out more clearly. And what is God saying to us through this? Well, I, I particularly feel the thing that was coming out to me most clearly as I was preparing was that we see co contrast in Solomon as someone who had great gifting, but actually had very poor character. And I think what I, want think, what I think God wants us to consider this morning is what are the giftings that he's given us? Are we, are we operating in these giftings? Are we sitting on these giftings or burying them or actually living, living these things out? And whether some of these giftings may be uh, a bit of a safety net, I'll explain what that means, but something, sometimes these giftings may actually get in the way of what God wants to do in us. And how do we make a decision to partner with him to make sure that we're developing our character whilst pursuing our gifting? So at this point, I'm going to invite John T. just to come up, um, just to break the voices up, and just read through the first half of the book. Okay. So. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very large caravan, with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all that she had on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he had made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She said to the king, the reports I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. 
Praise be to the Lord your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices and precious stones. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba brought uh, to the king of Solomon. Hiram's ships brought gold. Is that in that one? Yeah. Hiram's ships brought gold from Ophir. And from there, they brought large cargoes of amalk wood and precious stones. The king used the Amalgwood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and for the royal palace and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. So much Amalgwood was, had never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. Then she left and returned with her retinue to her own country. Um, and I think, and we see that she came to test him with hard questions, and she laid all the things that she had on her mind. So clearly, there was a curiosity and an interest in the wisdom that she'd heard about for Solomon, but she wanted to see that with her own eyes. <clears throat> and what does that say to us? Well, I think, as a community, we shouldn't be surprised if... There are people who are attracted to what we have and want to understand it for themselves and, and exercise that curiosity. So she, wasn't, she was bringing hard questions, it says. This wasn't questions to kind of catch him out or like the Pharisees were with Jesus who wanted to, to sort of trip him up. This was, there was a genuine curiosity and a genuine wanting to understand. And I think it's right that we should expect that for ourselves. Isaiah 60 verse 3 talks about... Um, there's a promise that nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We see that in this chapter. We also can expect to see that, I think, for ourselves. And then there's an opportunity there. It's incumbent on us to give a true account. We talk about sharper witness, this word that's been over us as a community. There's an opportunity there to remain relevant or, or just think, well, it's just, it's just what we do or it's just how we are. If you think about the example of community resources, where there's a lot of interest from government, a lot of interest from people in authority to come and see and understand why. And there's an opportunity there to not just soak up the praise, but say, it, we can't do this. It's not about me. And point it back to, point it back to God. It's about the redemptive work of Christ in our lives. Then the next thing I wanted to draw out was what we see is, is Solomon's giftings on display, um, particularly in verse 4 and 5. So it was the thing that Queen of Sheba came to see in Solomon was uh, the wisdom, the palace he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending of his servants and his robes and his cupbearers, and all this stuff. And if we track back to Chapter 3, 1 Kings chapter 3, this is where we see the thing that God promised to Solomon. He said, I will give you, this is of course when Solomon asked for wisdom. And so Solomon said, I will give you a wise and discerning heart. So he gave him what he asked for. And he also gave what he did not ask for, which was wealth and honor. Okay. And... And so what we see in this chapter is that it's both the wisdom that was on display, but also the wealth and the fortune. So God had been faithful to the promise that he'd made to Solomon, and he had both of those things. 
But oftentimes it's not enough just to be, for God just to promise us or give us a gift. There's actually a responsibility on our part to walk that out. That doesn't happen in a vacuum. That is incumbent on us. Um, and I think we see that Solomon was flowing in that. He was offering his wisdom. He was responding to the questions. And I think, I think there's an encouragement for us to exercise the gifts. So we, we look at it in, um, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. And it says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. That's, that's something that we have to do. There's a responsibility there. God may give us a gifting, but there's, some, there's a part for us to play in exercising and bringing that gift around. So, and I think there's, there's an implication there. Either we can choose to walk in the gift or we can choose to bury it. Think about the parable of the talents. Those three individuals were given things that they could do and invest. Some of them walked in it, some of them chose not to and buried it. How do we find out what our gifting is? I think that's an interesting question. And Jamie, I think that was a good example that you had. So Dan asked me for an example at 8.30 this morning. <laughs> um, so an example of where we have to embrace our gifts. I, was, um, I grew up and I'd had different leaders invest in my life that, that I'd really benefited from. And I remember taking certain challenges that I was facing to them to get, to get their input. And it was really solid, good input. The challenge I had was, unless the scenario unfolded exactly as they suggested and the script that we'd worked out, it, it would end up collapsing. And I saw that their giftings were somewhat like different X-Men. So you know there's that X, X-Man that can kind of teleport from here. They kind of zoom around from different places. And you see like in movies where they manage to get the heat-seeking missile is heading towards them and then they can move it around, they bring it back to the person that fired it. And I saw one of the, one of the people that I'd get advice from, they were kind of like that because they could see the hypocrisy that someone was bringing at them and bring it back round to help them see that very thing that you're firing at me is something that you're struggling with. I thought, oh, that's great. That's a great gifting. I'd love to have that. And I would try and replicate what they would do. And it wouldn't work. Then there was someone else that I'd get advice from. And even if they were under personal attack, it would just bounce off. And they were like the X-Men that kind of turned to metal. And it just, ding, ding, ding. I thought, yeah, I want that one. But it didn't work. And I was thinking... Why, why is this not working? And I was watching one episode, of one, one of the X-Men movies, and you know the Wolverine character? His power is he gets shot, and he falls down, and the bullet has gone into his body. But his body regenerates, and it spits out the slug, and it heals over, and he gets back up again. And I remember watching it thinking, oh, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> because I feel the pain. I can't stop the pain coming. I'm not quick enough to dodge or to bring things around or spot things like that. And for me, there was quite a big process of having to come to the point of accepting I've been made differently. That's great for them. That's their gifting. But this is my gifting, and I need to accept and walk in that rather than constantly wrestle against how God had made me. Thanks, Jamie. So I think that's a really good practical example of going on a journey to figure out what your giftings are and then embracing that. And at this point, I wanted to offer out some questions and actually give just a little bit of time for some discussion um, with the people who are sat next to you. So three questions, which I'm going to give you far too little time to discuss. First one is, do I actually know what my giftings are? And actually, when you pause and think about it, maybe that doesn't come quite as quickly as you might think. And I think you, you, we can be thinking about things that either maybe we know we're naturally good at, maybe I'm naturally organized, maybe I have a gifting in a particular um, area of service, or I'm good with young people, or, or, or I have a some kind of skill. 
those things are good to consider. But I think also maybe cast your mind back and think about promises that God's spoken over you. Because God spoke a promise over, over Solomon. He said, I'll give you wisdom. And I'll give you fame and fortune. And sometimes those things don't happen immediately. So are there also things that God has spoken over you, promises of giftings that you may not yet actually yet have seen? I think that's also important to consider. Second question, if you, if you identify there are gifts, am I exercising these things? You know, am I actually operating in the gifting? And I guess, as a follow-on, how would I actually, how would someone know? What, what would someone else be able to point to to say, that's Jamie and he's operating in the gifting that he just described? I hope that's clear. Turn to the person next to you. I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> Okay, 30 more seconds. Okay, let's be rounding up now. power. The power at my disposal. Okay, cool. So I'm not going to ask people to share and feedback, but I, I did want people to just bring this stuff to the front of your minds, because I think, we, we, and just hold it there almost, because we're, we're going to return to some of these things a bit later on. Okay. John T. You're up. So we're moving into the second half of chapter 10 now. The weight of the gold that Solomon had received yearly was 666 talents, not including the revenues from merchants and traders and all the Arabian, from all the Arabian kings and the governors of the territories. King Solomon had made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 600 shekels of gold went to each shield. He also made 300 small shields of hammered gold with three minas of gold in each shield. The king put them in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. The throne had six steps, and its back had a rounded top. On both sides of the seat were armrests, with a lion standing beside each of them. Twelve lions stood on the six steps, one at either end of each step. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's goblets were gold, and all the household articles of the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver, because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea, along with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years it returned, carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes, and baboons. 
King Solomon was greater than the riches and wisdoms than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world saw audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices, and horses and mules. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Kew. The royal merchants purchased them from Kew at the current price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. They also exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the Arameans. You can breathe. <laughs> Thanks, John T. So again, there's a lot in that. And I think, first thing, if you look at all that, and you think about the fact that Solomon was a king, he was at the height of his kingdom, he had been gifted by God, fame and fortune, all these things were things that God said he would give to him. And you think, okay, so he's, you know, building thrones, he's building his army, he's reinforcing various things. You know, these all kind of sound like things of, that a king who was wealthy might do. And there isn't any explicit condemnation from the narrator on any of these activities. So it kind of looks okay at first. But then if we look at the broader, broader story of the Bible, we take a step back and look at some of the law back in Deuteronomy, um, we can see that actually this was very blatantly Solomon violating the very thing that God instructed him to do. Uh, and we'll, and we'll, we'll show in very stark contrast how it was that that happened. But I think it's, it's an indication of him operating with, with poor character. He had the gift, but he didn't love the king. So we see Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 20. This is where we see God, predict, God predicting that Israel would ask for a king. So way back in, in, in the passage of the law. And he said, when you enter the land, your God is going to give you the God is going to give to you and have taken possession of it, you will say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. And essentially at that point, the people were rejecting God and God knew that was going to happen. He knew that they were going to ask for something. They were going to want to put someone else in a position of authority that God should be. He knew that they were going to be in this new land that, and they'd been called to be salt and light and instead of standing out, they just want to be like everyone else. This was something that God foresaw and that he, he talked about. But alongside that, he offers some very specific instructions about how this king should and shouldn't be and um, in order for him to be successful. And essentially, as we can see, he, he violates all of these. So we've got... On the left, we've got the passages from Deuteronomy and, and what actually happens in the story of kings. So first of all, it says he must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself and make the people return to Egypt. Well, then we see in the passage we just read, he accumulated horses and he acquired them from Egypt. Secondly, he, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Jumping ahead to the next chapter, chapter 11, it really lays out just how far he'd fallen in terms of the number of wives that he accumulated. Again, a very clear, direct violation of the thing that God had told him not to do. Thirdly, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. And we see the, the statement there, which is quite startling, that silver was considered worthless because there was just that volume of accumulated wealth in Solomon's kingdom. The, the next one is that he was called, Solomon was called to, to revere the Lord. And I think this is kind of, this is where it really fell apart for Solomon. This is what happened first. He lost sight of the king. Um, he, he didn't love the, the law, and he didn't love the word of God. You know, had he been 
had he been familiar and, and, and reading the word, the word as was instructed, he would have known that it wasn't right for him to be doing all the things he was doing. Why was he doing them? Was he just in violation? Or was he just ignorant? It doesn't say. But it's clear that his heart was not after God. We talk about David, the contrast of David. His heart was after God. Solomon's heart is just exposed here. And finally, not to consider himself better than his fellow Israelites. And you just see the, the, the way it outlines that he made this elaborate throne with six steps that you had to climb up to. You know, he was positioning himself way above the people. And this is a real sign of how far he'd fallen from chapter 3, where he was humble enough to say, God, give me the wisdom because I want to rule these people that you love. So something went wrong along the way. And I think, really, it was that he lost sight of God. Okay. So that's nice. But what does this all mean for us? Um, and so, for me, I think it's really interesting. As I was coming to prepare this talk, and as we were saying at the beginning, we're expecting that the things that we're, t we're learning about on a Sunday extend beyond just a teaching and actually have application to our real lives. And I, I've got a real live example of how God has been trying to develop my character in a specific area of gifting. And actually, as, been, as I've been preparing this very talk, and I guess the gifting that, in, in my specific situation, is one that relates to my field of work. Now, people often ask me, Daniel, what is it that you actually do? Um, and my heart kind of sinks, because I have to say, oh, I'm a consultant. And then people are just like, what does that actually mean? Um, and the reality of the matter is that no one actually knows what a consultant does. Um, <laughs> which makes it difficult to explain, but I guess you could probably say that if someone is in consultancy and they're doing their job well, they're probably good at taking lots of complex information, boiling it down and presenting it in a kind of clear, concise, digestible way. And so in, the, in my field of work, that is something that has been honed, that's something that I've developed over a period of time. And it's actually something that I, I kind of brought to Jamie and said, hey, look, I, I feel like this is something that that I can do, and I, I want to help you, and I want to support you in the context of what we're trying to do as a community. And so there were some practical ways, developing some, some infographics, I guess also kind of volunteering, putting my hand up and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to teach on a Sunday. So I guess I was ex you know, exercising the gift and walking in the thing. But when I actually came down to like put pen to paper and prepare for this, it was like I had writer's block. Like, I had this vision of creating this really visual, nice summary of all this stuff and it all to look great and it all to kind of communicate and get the message across. And God just stopped me in my tracks. He stripped it away from me. And it was really frustrating and very humbling. And so I ended up coming to Jamie and saying, hey, Jamie, you know you asked me to prepare this talk? Yeah, it ain't going so well. <laughs> you know I said I was going to communicate all this stuff? Um, I'm struggling. And actually, the faithfulness of Jamie to that time to say, well, so what is God actually talking to you about in this passage? I said, well, I feel like it's the character and gifts. You know, it was Solomon that was gifted, but he had poor character. And it's like, oh, OK, that's interesting. Do you not think it's surprising that the gift that you feel you've got to contribute is what God is speaking to you about? And isn't that a very real and live example of what we're talking about in this chapter? And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it is, yeah. And it was really interesting. And I feel like, you know, through, through that episode, which was actually quite difficult and quite a struggle, I feel like God was just revealing several things to me. And I think one of them was that, for me, the gifting had actually become a bit of a safety net and a comfort blanket. You know, I was so focused on how am I going to make this thing look good and communicate the right thing, that I was sort of blocking myself up from hearing and accessing the, th the, the words of God, the, the things that he really wants to communicate to you, to this community. I'd sort of got, I'd sort of got fixated and focused. And, and God was faithful. He allowed my gifting to fail me because he loved me too much to allow me to do it myself, to operate in my own strength, to be self-sufficient. I've got this. I can figure this out. This is what I do day in, day out. I'm just going to get this thing sorted. He loved me too much not to allow that to happen. And I think I saw this as this is an opportunity 
for me to develop character. And we see in, in Romans verse five, uh, Romans chapter five, verse three and four, not only so, but also, we, we also experience glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces, produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So in the difficulty and the striving and the, and, and, and the kind of situation that I was in, this was, this was an opportunity for me to develop character. So what did that look like for me? What, what did character development look like for me in this situation? It was about not leaning on my gift, but leaning on him. It was about opening my heart up for God to change me. There was a need to repent. I was like, God, I, I, I need to turn away from leaning on this thing. I need to allow you to do something in me. Submitting my gift to him, asking God to, to change me. I can't do it. It's not about trying harder. I need you to do something, God. I'm really just asking me, him to fill me with a love for this community, but that's the thing. I want to hear what God's got to say for these people. Yeah, not about trying harder. And I think God, like, God really wants to work in partnership with us. That's, that's ultimately what it's about. It's not that we have to discard our giftings. We should be exercising those. It was not a bad thing for me to bring that and say, hey, I think this is an area I can serve. But he wants to work in partnership with us and not have us just being totally self-reliant and um, Jamie was telling, reminded me of an example of Rachel Turner. Some of you may know she is uh, someone who has a heart for children. She's a, she's a Christian. She's visited our church. She's got an amazing ministry, an amazing way of helping young people and children to, to connect with God. But she was talking about how she's so gifted at that. She's so good at that. She, she could put together this incredible program of events, structure them in such a way that people would turn up and think, wow, that was great even if God didn't show up. And that's interesting, isn't it? How often do we lean on our giftings, which are things that God has given us, but allow, not allow God the opportunity to come in? We've got fail-safes. You know? We've got things which... How would it be for us to just throw ourselves off the cliff and say, well, God, you've got to do it? Not to have structured everything, not to have organised everything. And, and I feel like that's... That's the essence of what God wants to bring to us today and for us to consider in these giftings that we've already talked about. Reflection questions. This is the last slide I wanted to show. So yeah, can you think of times where you may have clung on to your gifting such that it becomes a hindrance? It's a safety net. It's a comfort blanket. What might it actually mean practically for me to submit my gifting to God, for that to come second, to allow God room to take over. And how do I make sure I don't solely rely on my gifting, but look to develop my character, which comes from an experience of him? We've got to catch a sight of him. 